Welcome to William Tells, an insightful look inside the private music studio. This program is brought to you from Pedal Point Music in Atlanta, Georgia. Well, hello, my friend, and welcome to William Tells. I'm Will Suit. Today we have a very interesting program, and it's going to run a little longer than usual, but I think you'll be enthralled. My friend from college, Colleen Lively, is here to talk to us about violin studies, private violin studies, and why you should consider them if you're a violinist. You will want to tell your friends about this episode. so excited today to have Colleen Lively with me. And Colleen and I go way back, but today she and I are going to talk about our professions a little bit. First of all, welcome Colleen. It's so good to see you. Thank you, Will. It's a pleasure to be here. I was so excited when you said yes, enthusiastically about doing this. First of all, so Colleen, you are the president of SAG, is that how you say it? Or did I say it wrong? We pronounce it SAGA, the Suzuki Association oh, of Georgia, S-A-G-A. -A. You're fine. <laughs> sorry about that. That's okay. Excellent. And and so what do you do with that association? What? Why should people know about this? Uh, it's a great, well, first of all, it's under the umbrella of the Suzuki Association of the Americas. There are only 12 official state associations and Georgia is one of them and we combine our teachers our students our efforts into having workshops um, students having performances in the area um, all kinds of united effort under the umbrella of Suzuki Wow so uh, what is and this is probably a common question for you what is Suzuki what is the Suzuki method? The Suzuki method is sometimes called the mother tongue method in that the concept of when a child learns to speak their language, they don't wait until they're six and go to school and study English or Japanese or French. The concept of the mother tongue method is the minute a child is born, the mother, father, whoever starts speaking to them in their native tongue and it just reverberates into their brain cells. So the Suzuki method came up with the, Dr. Shinichi Suzuki came up with the idea of, wouldn't this work for music? If we start putting this wonderful music into a baby's brain, not literally, letting them listen to music all the time, and we make instruments small enough, couldn't a child learn an instrument at a very small age? Um, that is the basic concept of the Suzuki method. There's more to it than that, but basically you can start teaching at a very early age. Parents come with the children to lessons and it's just, sometimes I like to say you eat, sleep, and breathe the Suzuki violin method and you do at first. Well, that is very interesting. So really is tapping into the child's inner music ear as it were, right? Yes. Is that correct? I believe we are all born innate with uh, being able to hear and being able to understand music. No one is actually born tone deaf. Think about this. Your, uh, maybe your mother or father or grandmother sang lullabies to you out of tune, thus the aspect of tone deafness. But everyone is born with the concept of being able to understand pitches and the right pitches and the right tunes. So inside, in your mind, you're hearing them correctly, whether or not you're able to produce them correctly at the moment. Is that what you're saying? That right? is what I'm saying, yes. Okay. I, I remember having a piano student, an adult, and he kept saying, I, I'm tone deaf, so I can't tell. But yet, if he made a mistake on the piano, he would always correct it. So his inner music ear, that's my term. I'm not sure that's a real term. That sounds his good. Musical we'll go ear that. was working for him. Okay, back to you. So, uh, when a person comes to you to study violin, what's the first thing you want to do? Well, it sounds silly, but the absolute first thing I do is shake the child's hand. 
we'll, we'll sample in the studio. And I do this, and I do the rhythm pattern, Mississippi Hot Dog, which is four sixteenth notes followed by two eighth notes. And actually, I shake hands with the rhythm that we are going to learn. Because the first thing we're going to learn is Mississippi Hot Dog on our E string. So that is the the absolute first thing. There, there's a little bit before that, calling the parent on the phone, reminding them to get the proper size violin, get the book, get the CD, start listening to the music. But yeah, that sample is shake hands at the first lesson and that's what we learn, the rhythm. <laughs> well, that's, that's very cool. And I was shaking hands with you. I was remembering <laughs> where I learned, well, growing up, I was taught how to shake hands, but uh, you and I attended an institution uh, at the same time years ago, uh, and uh, they taught us how to shake hands there. I wonder Definitely. if colleges still do that. <laughs> mm, that was a weird thing, but good thing. Uh, yes. Shows confidence. Yes. <laughs> How soon after a person walks in your door do you want them to actually be playing a tune? Ooh, that depends on the age. If a child is three and the Suzuki method is set up for three-year-olds, there may be several preliminary lessons in which the child learns to just do the rhythm, hold the bow, hold the violin, um, hear the notes. Um, so I never actually tell a parent like, like if a three-year-old starts in August, hey, can we be playing a Christmas song by December? No, probably not for a three-year-old. But because older children develop quicker, usually a six or seven-year-old, I will tell them, sure, you'll play Jingle Bells by Christmas if you practice every day. So a three-year-old has a whole lot of preliminary. In the Suzuki Violin Method, we have all these fun games and learning games and learning bow rhythm games that we actually do before we actually put the bow with the violin. So let me ask you a question about that. That's really good. Uh, it triggered something in my mind. Uh, during those two or three months or six months or however much time passes, you're, you're seeing the child 30 or 40 minutes a week in a lesson. The work is done at home. How does the parent who does not know violin get involved to encourage the child? Because I, I see it here with piano students and uh, uh, my violin teacher. Uh, I see the frustration sometimes with her beginning students that it's just not fun initially. So how, do, how, the, how does a parent encourage and make that fun? What do you do? First of all, I love it when a parent comes to me and actually has no music background at all. That actually makes the better parent. You're kidding. Because I am serious. They end up asking more questions. So I like the untrained parent the best. And as we do the lesson, we kind of sit, I'm facing the child and the child is right behind the parent. And I always have the parent reach over and hold the, the child's bow hand. I show the parent, um, exactly how to do everything at home. When we're in the lesson, I say, I am the master teacher, which sounds cool. I'm the master <laughs> teacher. And I then, am the master yes. teacher. <laughs> and then when they go home, I tell the parent, you are the home teacher, um, which sometimes freaks out parents. But I tell them um, uh, exactly at each lesson, exactly what to do at home. And basically they're reiterating exactly what we're doing in the private lesson. Also, I tell parents of a three-year-old, do not stress about, oh, I have to practice 30 minutes a day. No, what what three-year-old can sit for 30 minutes? Yeah. So I say, do the list, the list that I tell you to do. Practice the bow hold 10 times. Practice putting the violin up and down 10 times. More than likely, you will spend about 10 minutes and then you'll be done. So That's showing, a routine. You're establishing it's a, routine. a routine. Yes, yes. yes. Cool. You're giving the parents all this and it's awesome, but do you really want the parents sitting in the lesson? Yes, I do. You do? Why? Yes. Um, for the Suzuki Violin Method, the parent, or by the way, there is the Suzuki um, cello, viola, bass, flute, and piano, but specifically talking about Suzuki Violin, with the parent in there, they see what is going on, even for, um, let's say, a 12 year old middle school kid. The parent is still in the lesson. I require them to be there. I teasingly say the parent, 
to the parent of a 12 year old, you're my secretary. You, you write down everything to do and the kid reads it at home. But the parent not only sees and they hear what goes on in lessons and even to the untrained parent, um, I shouldn't say that, but I do have a student now with no, an that, untrained that musical parent, yes. mm -hmm. but she knows when the kid is playing out of tune, she'll say, oh, I think Miss Colleen didn't mean for it. My students call me Miss Colleen. I, I don't think Miss Colleen wanted it to go that way. So the parent, untrained ear, knows how it sounded at the lesson, knows how it sounds on the professionally recorded CDs that the kids purchase, and they know that that something's not right. It doesn't sound that way. <laughs> so parents involved in the lessons highly, highly encourage. I actually teach traditional piano too. I make the parents sit in on the lessons because they see and hear what's going on and they know what their kid's supposed to practice at home. <laughs>
So in America, in the state of Idaho, where of course there is no subway, um, a group last year performed in a subway restaurant. Some of you know about the subway restaurants. So they were performing in a subway. <laughs> um, my friends, my Suzuki friends in Athens, Georgia, of course, there is no subway in Athens, Georgia. They performed in the bus station, which oh, was yes. very original. Yes. My students this year, I'm so lucky to live in the Atlanta suburbs because we have a subway, oh. um, the MARTA system. I got permission this year for my students to perform at the beginning of, it's called the North Springs MARTA station, the beginning of the outer skirts of the Atlanta subway system. And we performed there. The cool thing about performing in subways is that you have all that concrete great acoustics so oh, during yeah. this event back in the subways two weekends ago you had people in germany singing in somewhere and the bach singing bach chorales a cappella just had the most beautiful acoustics on there wow the one rule is you have to play bach um you, you cannot play boat mozart you can't play brahms it has to be a total bach concert you can't ask for money, can't be busking. <laughs> well, it's not so, an easy concert, then, is <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, we Sorry, had yes. We had someone at the, the Marta station two weeks ago ask, well, could you play a little Beethoven and Tchaikovsky? <laughs> I said, well, we'll come back for that. This has to be Bach, and we're not allowed to ask yes. for money. We want to bring the joy of Bach into forgive me for saying this, the common man, the common person who doesn't like often, yes, yes. Yes, who doesn't often <laughs> listen to Bach and let them hear how enjoyable it is to, to listen to Bach. Now my goal next year, this goes on the podcast, is to have my students play at little five points, which anybody in Atlanta knows. That's cool. All the subways come in together and oh, the yeah. acoustics, That's the... I, I'm just, I can't wait to do this. The acoustics are going to be phenomenal at Little Five Points um, subway system in Atlanta. Okay. And you're right. And I hadn't even considered that here until I saw it uh, in the post you sent me uh, that we had an area like that. We do. And the acoustics in there are yes. awesome. Wow. Good stuff. Thank you for sharing that with You're us. You're welcome. Before we leave Island, if someone wants to take from a, an instructor who's Suzuki trained, what do they look for? Oh, yes. Besides my studio. <clears throat> yes, your studio. Because <laughs> look if for we my can name her. Melissa teaches here. She's a great yeah, teacher. She's been on the podcast. Um, Melissa, yeah. Good. You um, you actually look under um, the Suzuki Association of the Americas, um, like type that in www Suzuki Association of the Americas, and there is a list of all of us who have received our training. Unfortunately, there are some people who say they are a Suzuki teacher. They hang out their shingle, but they've never gotten the training. There is a specific way we teach. So there are people who will say, oh, I teach the Suzuki method, but they, they don't know how you how to teach the minuets, how to process through. So you go on to the Suzuki Association of the Americas. Then you type in your city or your zip code and you will find teachers, Suzuki, officially trained teachers, certified teachers within your realm. Excellent. That's great information. Last little subject. Uh, how did private music study play into your becoming an instructor and a great musician? And I must say, and I've stayed away from this, but I'll go there now that uh, I met Colleen in college. And then, even then, and I, you, you were from Murfreesboro, am I right? No, oh, no. I actually was from Mississippi. I was actually from Tupelo, Mississippi, where Elvis is from. Really? That, yes. Okay. My parents moved what. when we were in college, moved to near, near Murfreesboro. Oh, so, but, right. so I do remember that, right? Yes. I have quite a memory here. I can't remember what I did yesterday or what I'm supposed <laughs> to do after this podcast today, but I can remember that. Uh, anyway, uh, I know you were quite a musician then, and uh, there was an instructor there you s studied under, Mrs. Stenson. She was my theory teacher, and uh, you you guys often provided us with wonderful accompaniment as well as solo 
music and ensembles. I'm rambling now, but I want you to talk about this. How, before then even, how did private music study play into your becoming the musician you are and the teacher you are? Private lessons are really, really important. I actually started, you don't know this yet, Will, but I started in the public school system in fourth grade in Tupelo, Mississippi. And I um, actually didn't have a lot of private hindsight. Hindsight's always twenty twenty. Oh, yes, yes, I great. should have asked my parents for, can I have more private instructions? So I didn't have a lot. It was a little scattered. But hindsight is always twenty twenty because the private lessons help you excel in your area. My um, my vibrato wasn't so hot when I got to college, and uh, Will and I, our mutual friend, Mrs. Stinson, corrected that right away. <laughs> that would have been corrected with private lessons. Um, a lot of other little technique quirks that would have been corrected in, you know, extensive private lessons. Private lessons help you to excel so much more in violin or piano. And um, hindsight, I did not get as many as others should have. My college private lessons were incredible because I was Intense. soaking up all these concepts. I, I felt that way in college as well. I mean, it's like, oh, that's what that's called. Right. You know, I and you're, you're a little better prepared. You have the terms in place and then you can and excel in college or whatever you decide to do as an adult. I have to butt in here that, that locally, because we're in Georgia, um, if you specifically um, strings, if you don't take private lessons, you don't really stand a chance to go to all state orchestra. Most people know all state is the best. You audition for it. It would be incredibly rare for a student to go to all state orchestra having not had private lessons. Private lessons just um, Goodness, sometimes I work with a student just on some hard passage from school. School teacher doesn't have time. Orchestra teacher does not have time to work on, you know, this five-measure problem. Yeah. And we solve the problem in the private lesson. Excellent. The fun part that I get to know these kids, I get to know these parents, um, I get to see these kids excel. Another podcast, we'll have to talk about where my students have gone, like, how Absolutely. good they are now. So you'll come back? I will, yes. Excellent. I Great. will, Will. I'll come back. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Well, thank you for being here today. It's so good to see you again. It's been a few years, and I was very excited when I talked to you recently, as I said, and you agreed to come on. And uh, I look forward to hearing from you again, and I know this has been very helpful to our listeners. So thank good. you. You, you are so welcome. Anytime, Will. All right. Colleen Lively, Suzuki Method violin instructor in the Atlanta area, my guest today, also president of Saga. Yes. Yes. And thank you, Colleen. You are welcome. <laughs> What an interesting conversation. I think she'll be back on a future episode. We have a lot to talk about. For now, though, that's all we have time for today. I hope that you are having a good day. And if you want to write in, ask any questions, if you want me to forward some questions to Colleen about violin, feel free to email us or just give us some input. Email me at William Tells at pedalpointmusic.com. William Tells at pedalpointmusic.com. And I'll answer you back. For now, though, remember that music is the constant voice beneath the progressions of life. William Tells is a production of Pedal Point Music in Atlanta, Georgia. Thank you.